The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 5407180850, AFSL 228986, and Orbis Investment Advisory Proprietary Limited, ABN 15101387964, AFSL 237862, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Orbis has been confidently investing in undervalued and ignored global stocks for over 30 years, applying the same fundamental, long-term and contrarian investment approach since inception. Orbis is interested in long-term potential rather than short-term performance, and their team of 60-plus investment professionals focus on unearthing companies trading for less than they are worth, rather than timing market trends. But to find these opportunities, you can't think and invest like everyone else. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of the Barclay Pierce Capital's Asset Management Division, representing you, the humble advisor, doing their best. I have done this before. You have already heard it. So I'm just going to go straight into it. We've got uh, Morningstar here. We've also got a very interesting fund manager here as well that we're going to uh, get straight into that as well. So do you ever check the weather in the morning? And I've done this. And you see that it's possibly going to rain sometime in the afternoon. So you pack an umbrella and you're walking through the city to the office. No one else is carrying an umbrella. Do they know more than you? Do you have one up on them? Does it really matter? What do they know? Or are they all just mindless mules who are just going along with the crowd and, and, and saw that no one else has an umbrella, so they didn't? And then you've got an umbrella and the next thing you know, you're stressing about this whole umbrella thing. Look, that's that's about as best a metaphor as I can get for contrarian investing. <laughs> and, and we're going to get into it now. So, so the guys that are carrying an umbrella when no one else is and the guys that aren't carrying an umbrella for some reason when everyone else is as well, going against the crowd. What's it got to do with behavior? What's it got to do with investing? And what's it got to do with you, the advisor who has asked us these amazing questions uh, through the Ensemble platform as well? So uh, yeah, we're going to find out what it is, when's it good to use, how much of it's good to use, hopefully who it uh, it's going to be used for as well. Keep those questions coming in the Ensemble platform. They are amazingly helpful for us to be able to do that as I represent you, the advisor, and what we do. I couldn't ask for a better pair of fellas to help us out, get to the uh, the tail end of these questions. Then I've got Ben Preston of Orbis uh, from Sydney today, Master of Arts in Mathematical Sciences from Oxford, where I always wanted to go. Chartered financial analyst Ben joined Orbis in 2000. He's a director of Orbis Holdings Limited and directs client capital in the Orbis Global Equity Strategy. Ben, how are you now? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Excited to get going. Yeah, no worries. Uh, the, the the clunky introduction, mate. You only have to do it once, and then it's uh, and then we can just crack on from there. The uh, I'm also joined from Morningstar, all the way from Montana. Uh, Ryan Murphy, Global Head of Behavioral Insights, Advice, and Financial Planning. Ryan, how are you now? Very good. Glad to be here. Well, oh, fantastic, and thank you for joining us here. I think I'm really good. I'm looking forward to cracking into some of the behavioral stuff as well, because it is an interesting. Like if you talk about the the link between and why we've got these two guests on today is because there is a link between that contrarian investing and the behavioral sciences and, and the different types of behavior. The sort of person that, that that doesn't carry or is proud to carry the umbrella on days when people aren't because they may know something. And if you can sort of see that the, the metaphors sort of go along there, the mispricing of assets when investors have a tendency to 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 travel as a pack, that does make for mispricing. And it does mean that there's opportunity where there's mispricing there is opportunity, and that's what that's what these guys do. 
I want to crack into sort of just the generally overall sort of thing. So Ben, we're going to start with you from Orbis here. Um, and this is the first question that we've got. Is contrarian investing as simple as just doing the opposite of everyone else? Is my ham-fisted metaphor about the umbrellas close or is it miles off the mark? Well, I'd never actually thought of the umbrella metaphor before, but I think it's a good one. If if um, if if it doesn't rain, all that it's cost you is carrying a small umbrella. But if it does rain, then it's really useful. Then you really get the benefit and you're the only one that does. So um, yeah, look, I think it's a good one. <laughs> does it just mean the opposite of doing what everybody else does? No, if all you do is the opposite of what everyone else does, you'll fail. And that's no more thoughtful than following the crowd, just knee-jerk doing the opposite. So uh, it's not about that. It's being willing to look where others are not. Yeah, I'll cheers for that. Now, look, Ryan, we're going to kick over to you on this one on the behavioral side. So simply, uh, now, I haven't really done a big focus on the behavioral sciences, and I had to do my physio exams just just recently, and behavioral was a big part of that. And that really opened a, a big box for a lot of advisors that had, maybe hadn't had as much of a focus onto the behavioral side um, there. What... Is there a certain is there a certain form? I mean, what is it about everyone sort of staying together and, and moving as a, as a pack in that behavioral side that is just so common in investing? So, I mean, it's, it's worth remembering that our brains have evolved um, to be here because of success on a very different environment. I mean, think of our brains as a species; we adapted to the Serengeti and so on. And so, when we saw a lot of people running in one direction, it was typically a good idea to follow the pack, right? There's a predator of some sort, and you don't need to ask a lot of questions. But the, the, what we take from that experience, how our brains are much hardwired, might be good for the Serengeti, but it's not necessarily good for how markets work. And so just because an asset now is starting to rise in price exponentially doesn't mean it's a good buy and doesn't mean that's something that people should be buying into. And so I think that a lot of the tendencies that people have that are naturally inclined, just part of how we're hardwired, can get in the way and lead people to make poor choices in a market environment. Yeah, that, that that is that is a good answer. We're going to go to the next question. So I want to loop back around. So as long as we've got that that area of of the behavioural side with people moving as as a pack, maybe actually Ryan, actually I'll I'll stick with you. Is there then something that's in the behavioural sciences that leads someone to say we're going to go against that? Well, I think so. I mean, there's there's the ability to slow down, be a little bit more reflective, and think carefully about what constitutes value in a marketplace. And just because it's popular doesn't mean it's a good buy, right? And so part of this are the, the feelings that go along with investing and maybe even having feelings that are contrary. So for example, if everyone in the market is exuberant or excited about one particular asset class, I think that there's habits that we can train ourselves to have to say, okay, why might I want to think differently? What might they not be seeing that I should be looking for? And so I think that those are things that we can train ourselves to do. And also, I think being around teams of people, we can help each other think these ways and ask each other hard questions to challenge our viewpoints and assumptions, um, because it's so easy to fall into the, the bias, say, of confirmation bias, looking for evidence to support what you've already concluded. And that's part of what's valuable in a review process to have people push back and say, hey, what assumptions have you made or what might you not be looking for? Well, that and then that does lead us beautifully to our next question, Ben. What does being contrarian actually mean for an investment sense? Well, as Ryan says, you know, there's a there's a really ingrained, deeply ingrained in our DNA uh, human need for social validation. Mm. And so it's leaning against that. And there's a reason that uh, that we have that. In fact, it's why we uh, thrived as a species. Recent research suggests that the Neanderthals were actually more intelligent uh, than we were as Homo sapiens, but we were more social. And so it's it's a it, people feel very strongly the need to fit in, um, and in investing terms, what that means is if you want to buy the shares, the same shares that everybody else is excited about because you're drawn to this this need to fit in, then we all end up bidding up the same group of shares, and, and we make those too expensive, and the risk is that investors end up overpaying. So while it's it's uh, it's been uh, helpful in our evolution. As Ryan says, it's not so good for investing, and really, what you want to be doing is doing the other thing. Uh, when you can, the only time you can really pick up a bargain is if there's reasons that other people are fearful or, or worried or concerned about some things that are going wrong. Usually, quite temporary. That you can use that fear. Uh, you can take advantage of it by buying shares for less than they're truly worth. You want to go into the fear side of things. Uh, what? And this is the third, the third of my questions from the advisor base. What is the premise that contrarian investing is actually built on? 
it, well, the world moves in cycles. And when things are going well for a company, that tends to get extrapolated into the future. So what happens is the investors put money into that industry, managements are willing to spend on capex, and that actually that, that brings a lot of capital into an industry or into a company, and it can mean that there's too much capital chasing the same profit pool, and that starts to mean that um, uh, people are cutting prices uh, to try to access those profits, and it actually can be depressing for, um, for, for profit margins and return on equity, and that can create a down cycle. Then it goes the other way. And uh, and so it's when when capital leaves an industry because people are despondent about the future, that can sow the seeds for the next upcycle. So by being contrarian, you're playing uh, against that cycle, and you're putting it on your side. Of course, as investors, we are supposed to look through those cycles, uh, but what we do is we end up amplifying them. So if if companies have a natural cycle in terms of their earnings that go up and down over time, then we collectively as investors tend to amplify that. And that's why the stock market is so volatile. It goes up and down more than would be justified by the fundamentals. So the premise of being a contrarian is that if you can buy when others are despondent, uh, then you can really get a bargain, but you also can limit your downside because the, you, you, you really have reduced your risk of overpaying. Yeah. And there's a fair amount of maths that's involved in that as well. Um, as Instead of just sort of checking, checking, checking the weather gauge that's on there. I mean, we don't have to go into the mathematics on it. That's 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 it. I was sort of like where that was left there. Um, back over to you, Ryan. And let's talk at sort of we're going into the opportunities for contrarian investors. Um, the specific biases. I mean, if it, um, what are the specific biases that create opportunities for contrarian investors? Yeah, let me just build on one point um, that was previously made by Good. Ben. So. Um, so, like, there's natural experiments that are done that elucidate these points really clearly. Like in Las Vegas, for example, people naturally gravitate toward tables that are hot, right? And you can see this if you watch the crowd; just start to see them move around. It's as if the roulette wheel has memory, right? Or the dice have memory, and people yeah. are acting in these ways. And I think what it, it highlights is that our brains are such amazing pattern recognition machines, and they're so good at it that they'll even find patterns that aren't there. And so it's very easy to get lulled into these kinds of things. And those are systems like dice or roulette wheels. These are systems that don't have cycles. You put market, market cycles on that, and then it even amplifies these tendencies more in a way that doesn't serve people's best long-term interests. And when you talk about biases, I mean, the things that we're talking about here over extrapolation, people start to see a little bit of a pattern and then imagine it continuing at infinitum. And it's, it's really, it's not that simple. And there's always going to be these return that returned to cycle, going back to baseline, these sorts of things that uh, get in the way of that belief of over extrapolation. Well, R Ryan, well, I've got you here on this one. So the uh, just on those biases. So with the study that we've done in in behavior and that we all had to do and that we have done in the past, there's a, there's often a, a, quite a substantial focus on the bad side, the downside, what you should be looking out for. This is why investors are bad. This is why you're a bad advisor. This is why you're. This is it, these sorts of behaviors are usually lead to negative outcomes. Yeah. And I, I, I've never really spent much time thinking about what the positives are on some of these things. Uh, is there anything that you can think of that mm -hmm. what what are what are some good biases that we should be looking at that might actually assist us in our jobs or in our right. lives? Well, I mean, there's there's status quo bias where people have a tendency to leave things alone, and that can be very useful to play to to help people understand that you know they shouldn't be trying to churn their portfolio or chase returns too quickly. Um, one of the things I find most valuable is this notion of framing. So how you describe a decision, how you set it up for people, how you lead them to think about it changes the kind of preferences and the way they make a decision. So for example, if you're showing someone the returns of a particular asset class, you have the opportunity to define what the x-axis is. That's time. But what time scale are we talking here? If you put the time scale very short term, you're going to lead people to think in very short terms and be reactive to whatever the market just did. And this may not be a valuable way to think about what the market is doing. And so we can reframe the decision when we show performance of a particular asset class or an investment strategy by showing what the proper time frame is. And that kind of reframing of the decision just by controlling what time frames people are thinking about is useful in nudging them to think more carefully and make better choices. So based on, based on that, what you just said, uh, is going against the herd riskier than going with it? That's, well, that's a pretty broad question for that's you. That's a broad right question, yeah. yeah. So let me just give you the economist answer of, well, yes and no, right? So I think that it's it's complicated. Um, I think that if if you think from a contrarian standpoint, you're going to have different returns than those around you at those times because you're doing different things. But that doesn't necessarily imply there's going to be more risk when considered broadly. 
Like for example, when you think of how bubbles form, like the housing bubble that um, came that occurred and, and popped. I mean, this is this is one of those things that a lot of people took on far more risk than they realized. And being contrarian in that moment would have de-risked in a way that would have been, I think, very helpful. So I don't think that contrarianism always is going to lead people to have more risk, but there's going to be in the short term some uncomfortable durations. Your example early on of the umbrella, there's going to be days in which there's sunshine and you're carrying an umbrella. Say va, and that's just the price of being a bit contrarian. But really, it's it's worth rethinking in the more holistic sense of rather than just think about that particular day or gosh that decision didn't work out. It's the much broader perspective of in the long run, does this help investors reach their long term financial goals? And would you say that I mean this is sort of probably more for the portfolio management side of things and and putting that hat on that is the diversification of styles more important now? Or I, I, I was sort of trying to find a way to, to to word this question that's coming from an advisor is diversification of styles for example, by adding contrarian important. And there's a question for both of you that you can just have at, I reckon, of that one. So I'll go first. I, th- I think it's, okay. um, yeah, look, diversification of styles can be very important. And it, and it does depend on where you are in the market cycle. There's a lot of times when dispersions from fair value are not actually all that great. And so the returns, the rewards available for being contrarian are not as significant as they are at other times. And I think when the market environment has got some real narrowness and, and big dispersions, such as we have today, actually, you know, that's when it can be really important to have that diversification. Most, a lot of funds today have ended up owning the same group of shares. So you can imagine that funds that describe themselves as growth managers will be heavily invested in in, in the big cap, mega cap stocks, you know, the, the, the magnificent seven as, the, as we call them these days. Yeah. And that's natural, uh, but the, the, the kind of the blended managers have migrated in that direction as well. And even actually some of the the, the funds that describe themselves as value uh, as value have, have found ways to describe those stocks as uh, as value. So a lot of active managers have ended up congregated in those same group of stocks. And of course, the passive managers are there too. And so the question is whether or not if you choose a range of those funds, whether you're getting the diversification that you need in the portfolio overall, because one of the things that shines through all invest- investment literature and all the academic studies is the benefits of, of diversification. I think there are times in market history where it's been quite dangerous to have been investing along with the crowd. Uh, 1990 would have been one of those when the world collectively decided that Japan alone, one country, was worth 37% of the market cap of the world. You now we did it all again 10 years later with the dot com bubble when we decided that 35 or 40% of the of the world's market cap was uh just in three sectors of the market and it's never just three random sectors it's 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 always the ones that have performed best over the, the last decade or so the ones where earnings are now highest the ones where valuation multiples have gone to an extreme so it's often congregating in the most dangerous uh, parts of the market. And that's where actually being a contrarian can protect you against some of the losses that can follow those type of episodes. Yeah. And yeah, let's think about those times in the market when people did go a little bit silly on those ones. I'm going to ask you about specifically, well, not specifically today, this day, but in a general sense, sort of, you know, the, the, the back end of 2023, which is sort of where we, are, where we are at this current time and the Magnificent Seven, which you did just mention as well. We've got Rates, generally speaking, that look to have topped, if not sort of on the area. We've got cuts coming in for 2024 now being factored in. A US consumer, which is still very much alive and kicking, a soft landing predicted. In Australia, we're always Australia. We go from boom to okay sort of area here. What are you seeing, generally speaking, is the, is the current market environment okay for contrarian investors or is this, is this a time to stay away? Well, well, it is somewhat reminiscent of some of those dangerous past periods. <laughs> And you know, you know that because we've come to believe, investors globally have come to believe that all you need to do is buy this this narrow group of seven shares and you'll you'll do fine. You know, the last time that uh, we believed collectively um, that that was the case, that all you need to do is buy one group of stocks, was 1973, and that was that was a bubble that was called the Nifty Fifty. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it didn't end that well. And it's actually no coincidence that 1973 was the year that that Alan Gray, who is the founder of our business, set up with the contrarian philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I, you know, learning from him, he used to love opportunities like this where investors believed that all you need to do is X 
because when everyone is thinking the same way, there's usually a, a really valuable opportunity on the other side of that. So uh, we, we're very excited to be contrarian stock pickers uh, now. Um, looking ahead, I think there's a lot of opportunity to go for. Yeah, that's that's okay. And I think that, yeah, the, the, no notes on that answer. That is a fantastic answer on that one. And the 73, I've heard the 73 thing mentioned a lot, actually, just recently with regards to a lot of other things in this in this market in this time as well. So we go into that at a later date. The, now, do you think that contrarian, Ben, I'm going to ask you and then I'm going to ask Ryan a similar sort of question uh, going on the same way. Would you say that contrarian investing is understood by advisors in the in the path that you take and the conversations that you've had? I think people understand it, but it can be very difficult to hold and very difficult to see it through. So people understand the logic. I think the logic appeals, but if it was so, if it was easy and the returns came along consistently, then you know everybody would do it. There wouldn't be a challenge to it. The yeah. difficulty with being a contrarian investor is that you go through long periods of looking embarrassingly stupid. And that's where it gets difficult. It goes back to this thing that we started the conversation about, about the, the social need to, to be within the group. If you're wrong as a conventional investor, you're wrong alongside your friends and the people you work with and your colleagues, and you kind of all feel um, like at least you've got each other's backs. <laughs> if you're wrong as a contrarian you wrong investor- together. You can be wrong together, and that's that's actually valuable from an emotional perspective. Uh, when you're wrong as a contrarian investor, you are wrong alone. Everybody points to you and says, "We told you this was stupid. Why did you do it?" Yeah. Um, so it can be it, it it can be very emotionally taxing for the advisors that recommend us. Um, you know the benefits are if you if you see the performance over the long term, it can be very powerful. But you really have to uh, educate one's clients about the long-term perspective and be prepared for those periods where you will feel and look a little bit silly. Well, I'm going to get on a bit of a bandwagon here. There is something about financial markets, specifically in the advice space, that does encourage that sort of we told you so behavior um, that comes in. Ryan, is there something that is just inherently wrong with my type of people that means that we do that and act like that all the time? Gosh, that's hard to say, but I I do know that there's a well-known bias called the hindsight bias. And this is a tendency for us as just for people and how our memory works of thinking back and seeing how something that was uncertain, how we know what happened, of being like, oh yeah, it was obvious. It was obvious obvious. it was going to happen that way, right? And this, I think, is a really pernicious tendency that gets in the way, not only of understanding the world, but in the way of learning. And and that that's really unfortunate. And so one of the ways to counter this is to have people make clear predictions, maybe write them down even privately, right? You know, I think in two months, such and such is going to happen and quantify it. I'm 90% sure this is going to happen. Yeah. And so you do these kinds of things. And if you look back on your predictions and you can go score yourself and you find out that your 90% confidence predictions are right only 70% of the time, that's good feedback. That's valuable. And that's worth knowing. And if you don't write these things down, your memory is not going to help you learn. It's going to say, I, I guess I always knew that was going to happen. And so it's this tendency, this hindsight bias that gets in the way of that. And so insofar as we can help uh, in our in the systems of people who are managing people's money and start to develop decision support systems that can help do this and shed more light on it, I think the better off we'll be. And that can highlight the value of contrarian perspectives in investment. I have an exercise actually on that though that we that I do with my analysts that that join us. And Ooh, there's God. a wonderful there's we have to I have this quiz, ten questions, but each answer is to be given, not in a, in a, in a specific, on it is kind of crazy questions like what's the distance to the moon? What's the weight of a jumbo jet? Uh, questions that you may not know the answer to, but you answer in a range where you're 90% confidence that is, it's, it's, you know, greater than X, but less than Y. And then you go through and you, you see how well people's, the actual answer fitted within people's ranges and you give them a 90% confidence range. So even if they don't know the answer, they should get nine out of 10. No one ever gets nine out of 10. Uh, you're doing well if you get kind of five or six or seven. So it's a really good way of reinforcing with people who are new to this for the first time, just how wide we need to set our ranges for the future, uh, just how pernicious the overconfidence effect can be. That's fantastic. Are there any other exercises like that that you could think that, that, that there may be? I mean, this is all about improving ourselves as advisors and asking those sorts of questions of ourselves. Ryan, is is, is there any other things that I could run my, my advisors through that might assist me with that sort of idea of it's okay to be wrong or this is sort of, this is how you can test yourself and make sure that you stay accountable to yourself and these sorts of things. 
Yeah, and to build on what Ben was just saying, I've used that that exact same quiz when teaching MBA it. students, right? And this is a, a group that benefits from a little bit of humility, induced humility, right? And so if people are using these 90% ranges, they should be having the right answer within those bounds 90% of the time. And exactly like what was described, the average hit rate is about 50%. And I think what this is highlighting is it's helping people know what they don't know, helping them become more aware of the limitations of their own knowledge, and also giving them a lot more feeling as to when you say you're 90% sure of something, here's what we should expect that to mean. And I, I don't think people have enough formal training along these lines. Their feelings are you know, more aligned to 70%, but there's a big difference between being 70% sure and 90% sure. In terms of exercises, it, the idea isn't to help people you know, not be wrong or right, it's to help them become less wrong over time. And this sort of quantified prediction framework, have people make predictions, write them down, and give them feedback. And of course, you know, no one's going to get predictions 100% right all the time. That's okay. But if we're not going to be able to, to make a clear system and have clear feedback that is not distorted by memory, then we're not going to be able to help people learn that, that is very well said, Ryan. I'll, I'll tell you what, there is one fund manager who won't be mentioned, but uh, according to his Twitter feed, he's got a 100% strike rate. He is absolutely incredible. If everyone if everyone was judged and scored on their Twitter feed, I think that, uh, that we'd all be doing a lot better than we are. <laughs> and I think it's just something that's inherent in financial markets in this space where there, are, there will be people who say, I was right, I called it. And there will be people who make a living out of, you were wrong, you got it wrong, you should not be managing money. That there, there, there always will be, and there um, always will be. But but we should judge everybody the, by the same standards, which is you know the performance that they can actually generate uh, over long periods of time. And if you measure that correctly, it will shine through. Um, one of the benefits of I think of being contrarian is exactly when you think through the idea that that Brian just brought out about people tend to think they're correct more than they actually are. They tend to think they're 90% sure when they're only 70% sure. All of that actually gets baked into share prices. And, it, and it's why uh, share prices get so convinced that the future's bright, that they go to record highs. Um, maybe the confidence that's embedded in those share prices is not actually representative of the, of the true path of the world. So, you know, I mean, I, I joined Orbis in 2000 and used to make these wonderfully precise uh, models about the future of the world. And, you know, when you when you sit back 20 something years later and all the things that have happened in that time, uh, the, you know, 9 11, the Twin Towers, uh, COVID, um, the great financial crisis, the growth of China, the invention of the iPhone. I mean, the future is full of surprises. Well, now we've got AI coming up and, and completely changing the world that we can see as well. Not only changing the world from an investment case, but changing the world for the way that we will be investing too. It, and in a way that it's going to be quite difficult to predict what those changes will be. And anyone that tells you exactly what the future holds for AI, you know, personally, I'd be suspicious about that because it's it's uncertain. It's inherently yeah, I, uncertain. I agree with that too. There's no there's no certainty. Uh, even on the even on the certainty that comes in of oh well, these jobs are going to be eradicated. I stand I stand firm against that as well for people who say oh look at what's going to happen. I'm more of the the productivity changes are going to increase, and people will be able to extend themselves beautifully outside of their own jobs and their own role. And so, I, you know, I'm going to ask you off the cuff here, Ben: is is there a setup? Is there a setup with the AI boom and all the chat and the consensus is on that for a potential contrarian move on this one? That I got too specific on it. Yeah, there may well be, because as we've discussed, the future is a lot harder to predict than each of us individually tends to perceive. And so when a very, very rosy future gets baked into the share prices of some companies and a very bleak uh, future gets baked into the share prices of others, our tendency is to look, when everyone's very excited, our tendency is to, th to question you know, what, what might go wrong here. And when, um, when everyone's very bleak, then our tendency is to say, you know, actually, what might people be missing? Might, might there be some optimism um, that's not in the share price? So you tend to examine the other side of the coin. Is it possible also just sort of talking about, and Ryan, I've, I'm going to pull you into this one now that we've sort of mentioned, I've, I've opened the Pandora's box of artificial intelligence, so now we're going to have to go down there. But there is, this is about the contrarian thing and behaviors as well. Do you think that artificial intelligence, they're just being a few boxes that people look at for, for their answers now? If you know what I mean, like you've got Chat GPT, people just reach for that, and that's going to go. If, if I ask it here and I ask it over in California, it's going to give me the same answer. If I ask it the same question, do you think that maybe that artificial intelligence will lead to more herd mentality in financial markets? 
That's highly speculative. Actually, to back up, if you ask ChatGPT the same question twice, it can give you different answers. Oh, okay. Or, so well, then that right. screws the whole thing up there. Yeah, no, go on, go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, the algo has this this kind of this feature built into it called temperature. So it adds a little bit of noise to its answers. It makes oh. it seem more conversational, slightly more human. Uh, but it turns out in terms of accuracy, it may not be what you want in a model. I think that the idea, when if everyone starts to use exactly the same mathematical models to make predictions about the world, you could start to see this start to focus in, right? And this, in its its own way, would be something that would support a kind of herd mentality. I think that itself offers opportunities. If you have insight in that the vast majority of people are using a particular model to price something, and there's you know extra information you have that's pertinent, that could give you a substantial advantage. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I can see, it. and I don't. I do want to go down this road of of the artificial intelligence sort of and where it can take us to. I've actually I've got to give a speech later on, and I'm going to bring this into it that AI AI can do a lot of things in finance, and it can do a lot of things with with answering questions and putting things together for portfolios and, and financial you know in the financial planning space as well. But it will never be able to sit across the table from a client when you're presenting something and see an eye twitch when you mention something that could be a, an area that they don't want to go into. I had a a client, I mentioned a, a Chinese ETF that I that, that I wanted to go into, and I just saw a little eye twitch and a bit of a shift between them that I don't think any computer would ever be able to pick up. And I, I went into it, and I had to ask them a little bit more about it, and, and it turned out that they were very uncomfortable going into China, but they didn't want to say anything. They didn't want to they didn't want to make any fuss about it because we'd already set everything up. And it turns out that we actually managed to extrapolate a lot of that thing out there and amend a yeah. portfolio that, that meant that they weren't going into things that they weren't comfortable going into, but they were just too polite to say. That's... Yeah, it- I think these systems are, are amazing tools, but they're good in terms of uh, completing sentences that have already existed. So the capital of UK is, right? And that these systems are going to know it's London and be able to provide that answer. But when you get to idiosyncratic things that are particular to that individual client, what he or she believes, what their preferences are, what they want, what their goals are, what they're trying to accomplish, sometimes the most valuable thing advisors can do is ask the right questions. And AI so far is not great at asking questions. It's good at answering questions that have clear answers, but asking questions in a conversation to really draw out what drives people, what their fears and and uh, preferences are, this is something that it doesn't do well yet. Yeah, and I, I'm going to cling on to that as, as hard as I can because it could be one of the last bits of value add that we t- we actually have in this industry. So that's 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 where we need to go from there. Um, and sort of back on back onto topic now, and we're almost ready to wrap this up. We've almost gone through all the questions here. Now, let's go through a successful contrarian strategy of what you need to, to, to pack together. Ben, over to you. What are, what are the main foundations of a successful contrarian strategy? And one of these now might be having a really good artificial intelligence terminal at your desk. It, it, it might well be. I mean, it's as it, who knows what AI might be able to do in the future. I, I would um, encourage investors, though, to tend to put away the crystal ball. It can be fun to speculate about what the future might hold. Um, but really, the, the the advantage of a contrarian investing strategy is that we're leaning against the biases of others, um, and and so what we try to do is look at things differently, come at a problem from a different angle, uh, examine the other side of what's popularly discussed, and that's when you might get onto something. But the real difficulty, the challenge, is when you believe that you've discovered something that may not be well understood. Do you have the courage of your convictions to really act on that? That's what can. That's where the behavioural bias is about sticking with the herd will count against you as a human being. And 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 how do you persuade people and empower people to do that? That's where we've had to think very deeply and carefully about the way that we structure our organisation to allow contrarian decisions to come through. In other words, if you have an investment committee, then you're never going to get a contrarian decisions shining through because it will be outvoted almost by definition. So how do you structure the systems to allow uh, th- those individual uh, viewpoints to come through? And that's part of the challenge and part of the fun. Yeah, very good. And I, I believe it is as well. Is there a sort of, uh, I'm sort of just thinking, Ryan, I mean, you, with the behavioral expertise that you have, is there a way that you need to sort of position yourself mentally if you are going to start taking taking more of a contrarian position on, on areas? If you're not, it, do you sort of see where I'm going with this one? Like, how do you, and I know that we've talked about, okay, writing it down, that's sort of something that everyone should just do anyway with their confidence levels. But is there a, you know, sort of how do you ready yourself to sort of lean into the storm of of, of a contrarian investor? Yeah. So I think it's a kind of mentality and a kind of habit of thought. And it's, it's not a 
particularly nice one and it doesn't invoke positive feelings, right? So contrarians make themselves a little bit miserable by asking, what am I not seeing? Other people say it's a simple, easy narrative. Yeah, maybe it's not so simple. Maybe it's not so easy, right? This kind of this kind of tendency, this reflex of thought uh, when you hear an explanation that's neat and simple and tidy, that immediately there's skepticism to say, yeah, okay, but what's the other angle here? What am I not getting? And I think it's that kind of natural skepticism, that tendency that different people have when thinking about the world. Um, some of that is, is embedded in how scientists view the world, right? You know, you have lots of data before you and you're trying to figure out how to put this together and what makes sense. And maybe you have a theory that it works in some ways, but not others. And you're maybe there's a tendency for people to look for data that corresponds to theories they like, right? Good scientists let go of this and are trying to figure out how the world works. Similarly with investing, right? The goal here is not to have positive feelings, not to be uh, right with everyone else at the same time, but really to have a thesis that one comes from one's own position, one's own views, and be able to have the courage to act on it, and in doing so generate outsized returns that others who simply follow the crowd won't. Yeah, very good. Uh, ben, and uh, we're almost ready to wrap it up now, so we'll just go to last bids very shortly. But Ben, is there a way, speaking personally, and this is sort of just more from, from the in the industry, making ourselves better, is this something that you personally need to do to be able to lean into this and do it? Or is it just, it just that you're okay being where you are and comfortable in your own skin? Is there any self-checking that you need to do to just to make sure that you're still on track? I was smiling as Brian was describing the emotional Miserable. journey. Yes, <laughs> because we, 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 ne we can never rest on our laurels. We're always questioning. And, and, and I think you have to be a little bit paranoid to, to uh, do a good job of contrarian investing. A, a great mentor of mine put it this way. He said, before you make an investment, you should really do your homework and make sure you understand what you're investing in. And once you've done that and, and you're, you're happy, you're comfortable... Go and talk to your friends and family and see if you know they're supportive. And if if everyone agrees with you, don't do it <laughs> because you must only uh, you'll only pick up a real bargain when you when you're doing it on your own. And 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 that in a nutshell is what makes it so challenging. Yeah, yeah. When you're it's what is it the, the, the trades that make you the most nervous are usually the ones that make you the most money. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then somehow the trades that have made me the most nervous have often lost me a lot of money too. So it's I can't really. There's no maybe I just just not very good at it. That's why I sort of call people like you. Um, now, on that note, I think I'm going to close it off. If anyone's got anything last to add, then please uh, speak now or forever hold. And on that note, there you go. I have been joined by Ben Preston of Orbis, uh, directing clients in the Orbis Global Equity Strategy. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, Morning Stars representative today, Ryan Murphy, Global Head of Behavioral Insights, Advice and Financial Planning. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ryan. Of course. Thanks for having me here. No worries. Now, everyone, make sure that you keep those questions coming in. Get onto the Ensemble platform. Ask away. I think that that was a very, very good conversation that we just had there. We went into behaviors. We went into how to get yourself set for contrarian investing. We went into what makes people follow the herd and whatnot. And then we also went into a little bit of market stuff as well, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Today, I am James Whelan. Uh, I don't know what I do here. Managing Director of Barclay Pierce's uh, Asset Management Team. If you have any more questions, please let us know. Otherwise, have yourself a great day and stay safe.